Hi, welcome to our third podcast yep. of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And uh, this week we're going to be talking about uh, an extension last week, the canine non-core vaccines. Yes. So the core vaccines were the ones every dog should have. Mm-hmm. Non-core vaccines are ones that we base on our lifestyle, yeah. their situation. Not every dog needs to have these vaccines, but a lot of dogs do. So there's three non-core vaccines that uh, are available. There used to be more, but the, as things change, people, yeah. different vaccines, either we find out they're not effective or they're not needed. Um, one of the vaccines that's available that we don't do a lot is coronavirus vaccine. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. In this the, area, very common. Well, and it's, it's uh, the disease doesn't really cause a very clinical sin, symptoms, and the vaccine doesn't really help. Yeah. So um, it's still available, but you know, your dog does not need that. Um, the big ones we do see are the Bordetella. Uh, Bordetella bronchoseptica is often called kennel cough or infectious tracheobronchitis. Those terms are actually a little bit more broad. That includes the, the adenovirus we talked about last time, the mm-hmm. parainfluenza, and even the, the flu. Or some owners call it Bordetella. Yes. So if you have some owners who say that, it is the same vaccine. Um, so we'll, we'll often call it the kennel cough vaccine. It's just a little bit mm-hmm. easier to, to do that way. Um, it can affect dogs, cats, <laughs> rabbits, and even people. Oh, rabbits. Yeah, I think I had kennel cough in vet school. You had kennel cough I think personally? I did. I oh. think I did. I was I had a really bad cough for a couple of weeks. I felt sick as a dog. Did you get vaccinated for it? No, I got myself on some antibiotics and I was fine. Uh, well, yeah. next time I'll poke you here for it. The um, the nice thing, well, the thing about the kennel cough is it, or, or the Bordetella, is it really affects the younger animals more. Yeah. Older animals, they're going to get a cough. They're going to probably get over it. Antibiotics would be very helpful for them. But it can actually be fatal in, in very young animals. Mm-hmm. So the, the best advice I can give is not even to board or take the young animals to daycare. Yeah. Don't even risk it. Wait till they get their vaccines done. Um, canine influenza. Yeah. This is a, this is a relatively new disease. It was first uh, found in 2004 in uh, racing greyhounds in a track in Florida. And they think that it may have crossed from the uh, equine influenza from a nearby horse race track. Oh. Um, and a lot of these flu viruses, they do, you know, the people flus come from dogs and pigs. Yeah. So, uh, did so say like dogs? Can, I said you ducks. said dogs. Ducks. Works. The people flu comes from ducks and pigs. Okay. So uh, that's something that we, uh, uh, that's how they were able to determine the vaccines to give the people. Is they see what is affecting the, yeah. the ducks and pigs, and then they come up with the vaccine Good from there. Us. Um, so it's, it's been spreading across the country. We actually had a couple of outbreaks up here in the Chicago area a few yeah. years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of dogs died from this. Yeah. Um, the yeah, main reason, there had been a flu vaccine available as early as 2005, but we hadn't been vaccinating because we weren't seeing it here. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you get a dog that comes in, you don't have anyone vaccinated, they're going to get sick. They're going to spread it. It starts with a, a cough. It can progress to pneumonia, and there are a lot of dogs that died from this. Yeah, they had the fevers, they stopped eating, um, vomiting, they just weren't feeling well at all. And the interesting thing is, they found that um, this flu vaccine that was hit in Chicago was actually a little bit different strain than the one that they discovered in Florida. So they had discovered the H3N8, this was the H3N2. So they quickly came out with a vaccine that covered that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's actually three vaccines you can get, the H3N2, the H3N8, and then the combo vaccine. You should be doing the combo vaccine because there's no evidence that there's a significant cross-protection from those other vaccines. So making sure you you get that combo vaccine Mm -hmm. given appropriately. If your dog, uh, boarding. Boarding, dog parks, kenneling. Dog shows. Yep. I um, even do for, like, board, just going grooming. to PetSmart Petco. Like, there are so many dogs out of shelters or adoption events there, and yeah. you don't know what their, you know, dogs are coming from and what they have. And so and the flu is spread so easily. It's mm-hmm. through um, aerosol, through the dog's coughing, but even contaminated water and food bowls, yeah. leashes, collars that they've found virus on. Mm-hmm. So it's really easy to spread from dog to dog. The last vaccine that's part of the non-cores is Lyme disease, Lyme. Borrelia burgdorferi. So this was, uh, you know, uh, first started out in Connecticut, Lyme, Connecticut, where it was first diagnosed, and it's spread around the world now. Yep. And it's spread by ticks. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit slower to spread than some of the other diseases because dogs can't give it to each other. But as the ticks spread with the wild animals, then that's how the Mm -hmm. disease spreads across the country. Yeah, I think most owners don't understand, like, even if your dog goes outside just to poop and pee, you can get a tick or anything because most owners say, oh, my dog only goes outside just to go potty. 
Yeah. Well, if you have squirrels, raccoons, if you're next to a forest preserve where there are deers, they're dropping ticks like everything outside has right. fleas and ticks. And those ticks can just easily grab onto your dog. And if you have a really fluffy one, you're not going to notice there's a flea well, there. And these deer ticks, especially the larval forms, are very tiny. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see, see these things. No. Um, they, they have to attach for about 24 hours to transmit the disease. So if you can kill them early enough, you can prevent it. If you're not using good flea and tick preventative, even if you are, the Lyme vaccine is going to be a good option if you're in a high-risk area. So certainly everyone who lives in Lyme, Connecticut, has their dogs yes. vaccinated for Lyme disease. <laughs> Areas of Wisconsin, it's endemic. You have yep. to have the Lyme vaccine. Your dog's going to potentially be exposed. But we even see a lot of dogs in this area that get the Lyme vaccine for hunter dogs. Or um, we have some people who live next to the zoo um, because they get a lot of ticks there. Yeah. And so they get the Lyme disease or the Lyme vaccine um, just because of their high risk there. If you take your dog camping, hiking, mm-hmm. if you have a summer home that you visit with your pets, yeah. at Michigan, Wisconsin, those are areas where it's a, it's a big problem. Yeah, high tick area. And the when, when dogs become infected with Lyme disease, um, they may not initially show any symptoms or they may have very mild symptoms, but they can recur. Yeah. And it can progress, and they think it's repeated exposure that causes the more severe symptoms, the kidney disease, the neurologic disease, the liver disease that, mm-hmm. can, that can kill these dogs. Um, if we have a dog that comes in with a fever or joint pain or lethargic and they test positive for Lyme disease, we're going to put them on antibiotics. Mm-hmm. If they come in and we're doing our, our annual screening and they're positive, we may just wait and watch and see how it goes, but we're definitely going to recommend Lyme vaccine to yeah. those dogs because whatever they're doing, their dogs have been getting Lyme mm-hmm. disease. They're getting exposed, so protect them. And I always tell the owners, hey, if your dog's being exposed, you're being exposed mm-hmm. too. Make sure you're using some good insect repellent on yourself and checking yourself for those ticks because that can be a problem. So, um, you know, we talked about definitely those situations for Lyme and uh, for, uh, not for Lyme, for canine flu and Bordetella. It's going to be the boarding um, if you're uh, going to a daycare. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're doing a dog show, dog the dog park. parks. Yeah, huge. definitely dog parks. Or just, for me, any just high volume dog place. Like if you're taking your dogs outside to go camping and you know everyone in the area has dogs, yeah. protect yourself, protect your dogs, don't take the chance. And some people just do like these events every year where they have the dog walks and stuff. Mm-hmm. If you're going to bring your dog, make sure they're protected because yeah. you don't know everyone else who's doing that. Exactly. You don't know who's fresh from a shelter who's going to be coughing on right. your dog. Now, these vaccines, unlike the uh, some of the cores where we can do every three years, they have to be done every year. Yeah. Some um, boarding facilities still require board cell to be done every six months, too. Yeah, and I don't understand high that. Volumes. Yeah, it's I mean, they do have immunity for a year, but it's not going to hurt them to get that extra vaccine if mm-hmm. that's what they need. Um, if we can start the board to tell as young as 12 weeks of age... Okay. Um, same thing with the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine does require two initial vaccines, yes. uh, about three to four weeks apart. It can be as, as little as two weeks, but I like to do three to four weeks. I think that gives the best response for that. And same thing with Lyme. If your dog's never been vaccinated for Lyme, we're going to do two do boosters twice. and then once a year. Now, one of the key things, uh, particularly about the Lyme and the uh, flu vaccine, is if it's been more, teen, more than 18 months since your last booster, you're probably going to have to have start the booster series all over again. Oh, really? Same thing with lepto, they're finding. Um, oh. So for these back, killed bacteria vaccines, which these are, you're just not getting that immunity to last very long, and you don't get a good booster response if it's been more than a year. Oh. So if it's over 18 months, your dog's not been vaccinated, we're going to recommend two start vaccines. Over. Wow. Yeah. Kennel cough, since it's a single vaccine with the oral, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, there's an injectable, too, so we can't get the oral into some dogs, yeah. which we can't. Uh, we have that available. But the oral, it's they make the video where they show giving it. They make it look so easy to do. They do. The it's, dogs don't like it. It's not, it tastes like salt water. We should know. We get a lot of backlash <laughs> from it, and it's it's not good. We have to give a lot of chasing yeah, You've probably treats. been vaccinated for kennel cough a lot. Yourself. Many of times. Yes. Many times. I'm covered very well. Like you, you said you never took it, but I've had a few vaccines. Well, they'll sneeze on you sometimes, <laughs> too, and, and you'll get it that way. So, again, these are the non-core vaccines. It doesn't mean that they're not for every pet. Um, it means that certain situations mm-hmm. is where, how we're going to do these, and it's by lifestyle yeah. um, mostly. Um, and if you have questions, ask your vet. And if they're not asking you these questions, you can ask them, hey, yeah. should I be getting Lyme disease for my dog? Should I be getting the kennel cough and the flu because of this? And just make sure they're protected. 
it's far easier to, to protect these dogs than to deal with the illness mm -hmm. that they get. Um, they can shed the canine flu va virus for 21 days after yep. they're infected. So that means they can't they can't really go you anywhere. They can't go anywhere. You're pretty much on house arrest because, you know, your mm -hmm. dog, the immune system's down. You don't want them to get sicker. You don't want to spread it to anybody else. One of, the, one of the neat things about Lyme disease is we've been testing for Lyme disease for, I don't know, about eight or ten years. And when we first started testing, uh, we weren't seeing a lot of it in this area. About six, seven years ago, started showing up positive dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to see, uh, I'd say, about two or three cases a week. Mm -hmm. Since we've gone to the year-round tick protection, it's probably two or three months now. Yeah. Well, and then I know a lot of dogs... Uh, our certain flea and tick uh, preventions weren't working in certain areas because that's how bad the ticks were that our prevention down here or up here just don't work in other areas. Yeah. And so like the dogs are protected up here from our ticks and then they go Florida or something and they come back and they're, now they're positive when they were negative a few months ago. Right. Some of the ticks are a lot harder to kill. Mm -hmm. So if you're a little bit late giving your preventative. Yeah then they're at, at risk for disease. So um, some of the preventives, like there's a one that's supposed to last 12 weeks, but some of the ticks, it doesn't kill after eight weeks. Yeah. So you just have to be a little bit more careful with those things. Um, the best way to protect against Lyme disease is the vaccine and the yeah. tick protection. All right. Um, I have this really neat um, program that I want to talk about. It's called the Canine Courage Program. And I learned about this when uh, I did the Pro Heart 12 talk. Um, it's from Zoetis Pet Care. Yeah. So Zoetis Pet Care is a program. They do a lot of information for the owners. They do the rebate program for the Zoetis product, products. But they have this separate program. It's a charitable program that's designed to let caregivers for retired military and police dogs get a little bit of help providing health care for their, their animals. That's really good. So a lot of times these animals, when they're done working, they don't just go to a retirement home. They yeah. stay with the person they work with and mm -hmm. they become part of the family. But that adds an extra expense that normally was maybe taken care of through the, the work or mm -hmm. the military. So they'll give them a $300 debit card for veterinary services every year. Well, that's good. So that's that covers a lot of your yearly veterinary expenses. Yeah. Um, it's strictly through donations. Um, one of the other things that they're, they're starting to do is they're supporting a program called Pups for Patriots. I don't know if you've heard about this. No. What Pups for Patriots does is they, they train service dogs uh, to work with veterans that come back from uh, these war areas with PTSD or traumatic brain injuries, and they need some help doing their everyday life. It also helps deal, them deal with stress and anxiety. Uh, and they provide the, these dogs to them for free. You know, I do remember because I think we see a few, like two of them that come here or yeah. uh, a shelter who does something like this. They go yeah. to high kill areas um, and they get dogs that unfortunately no one wants, so the right. older ones or the bigger dogs, and they train them for veterans right. um, and give them a second chance for the dog and for the new handler at that time. And the dogs that we see, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want them. They're fabulous. They're very well trained. Um, very sweet. They're good with their, you know, their new veteran handler, mm -hmm. and they do. They help cover everything when they come in. It's a it's a great program, yeah. and it's a, a great service to give to our veterans. So I want to let people know uh, if you want to learn more about the program, it's K nine K dash nine, the letter K, the number nine, courage, all one word dot com. Uh, to apply for benefits, it's K nine courage dot com slash apply. So if you uh, have a retired uh, veteran uh, military dog or a police dog, go ahead and apply. Okay. If you want to make a donation, it's caninecourage.com slash support. They also have a toll-free number. If you have questions, it's 888-963-8471. Um, or you can email them at help at caninecourage.com. Mm -hmm. So we encourage everyone to do that. Yeah. Um, we're certainly going to be supporting them. Uh, we think it's a great program. Yeah, so if really you can good. help out, please do. All right, ready to move on to the pet health care news. Yep. All right. Got some cool stories this week. <laughs> now, this one's like, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's maybe not as groundbreaking as you'd think from the headline, but can dogs smell canine cancer was this, the article's um, headline. So there's a team at uh, North Carolina State University researchers, and what they're trying to do there, you've heard of dogs using being used to sniff cancer out in people. Yes. They're trying to see if they can use the dogs to sniff out cancer in dogs. Okay. So they were going to start with um, urinary uh, bladder cancer okay. because they figured, hey, the markers from the tumor is going to be excreted in the dog's urine. Okay. We I can, can see use that. the urine and we can maybe train these dogs to sniff out cancer cells in the urine to see what's going on. 
So the first test they did, they would train the dogs on a, uh, a urine sample that had cancer and a urine sample that didn't. Hmm. And they got very good results. They were, the dogs were able to distinguish between the cancer um, samples and the non-samples. Hmm. In the second phase, they added in some more control samples. So they had a bunch of non-cancer urine samples and the cancer sample. Dogs still were doing pretty good. They were reasonably accurate at picking out the cancer urine from there. Hmm. Then they started to make it a little bit trickier. They would put multiple cancer urine samples along with the, the control samples. And only one of the dogs was able to routinely pick out the, the cancer samples. Like a hound dog? Well, I don't, I don't know if it was a hound <laughs> dog, but it was weird. And then the last thing was double-blinded study where they actually took samples the dogs hadn't been exposed to before, mixed them in with control samples, and they didn't get anybody to, to work. To work. So the researchers, you know, they're so optimistic that they'll, they'll come up with something. What they're trying to do is see if there was, if the dogs could detect these cancer cells, uh, the cancer in the urine, and they could find a biomarker or mm -hmm. something that they could send a test for. What they think was happening is that dogs weren't keying in on the cancer. They were keying in on the individual dogs the from urine, their urine The sense. urine. Mm -hmm. So they, they need to maybe do a little bit bigger study, a little bit more samples, a little bit better with the training, and maybe it might become something that's useful in the future. Yeah. But uh, at this point, dogs cannot smell dog cancer. That's, that's kind of the takeaway I have from that. Interesting. You go to a place, oh, I need my dog to be sniffed out. Just, he's limping, just sniffing for oh, cancer, I mean, just in case. You, you send a urine sample to a, log, uh, to a lab, and then it goes through a bunch of dogs, and whichever dogs raise their tail, that's you know the disease <laughs> yeah, they have. Okay. Maybe this one has some urinary infection, not cancer though, but How about infection. stool samples and for intestinal parasites? That'd be great if they could they smell They would those. taste it, not yeah. smell it. Well, speaking of tasting things, here's a, an interesting story. Pet owners warned about deadly dog disease that's spreading across the UK. So there's a name mm. on here. So this is, um, we don't see this much in our area at all. I think this is primarily something that's happening in England. But uh, there's been an a increase in the number of cases of lungworm. Lungworm. Lungworm is a parasite. Again, we don't see much here, but it's usually concentrated in the south part of England, but now they're starting to see it all across England. Hmm. And uh, they had a, a, they do surveys. Last May they re had released that there was uh, over 2,700 cases reported in the country. And those are just the ones that they get that are reported. So there probably could be a lot more. Yeah. When there's probably more that aren't even diagnosed or misdiagnosed. Um, this is a really cool parasite, and I love parasites because it goes through multiple hosts. It goes through an intermediate host before it affects the, the final host. Yeah, I was reading it. Uh, intermediate host, sn slugs, snails, and frogs. Frogs, yeah. Frogs. Yes. <laughs> now, now, I don't doubt that dogs would eat slugs and snails and frogs. <laughs> But they can actually get it from the, the slime trail that the, the, sli the snails leave behind. So, like, they're licking up their slime? Yeah. Oh. Or they step in and they lick their foot. Okay, that's a little better. And what they're getting is the, the lungworms actually set up in the lungs. It takes a couple months for them to start producing the, the, the larva. But they produce larva that then pass through the dog's intestinal tract. Hmm. The snails and slugs get onto the poop, ingest the larva. Then they develop in those intermediate hosts, and then the dogs get and it from them. It just keeps them. passing. Ugh. It's really uh, kind, of, kind of disgusting. But they actually do have a preventative in England that, the, that you can give the dogs. So it's something that can be prevented. Huh. Just like the heartworms are a big problem here, lungworms are going to be an issue there. So a lot of people just don't understand about it. And so it's a matter of education. And same thing, we have to educate people every day on about heartworms mm -hmm. and intestinal parasites and why prevention is Is this as fatal as like heartworm? Yeah. Because it's in the lungs? Yeah, this can be a, a very serious disease. So they actually um, surveyed a third of the people admitted that they weren't using the preventative. Um, and um, this, the symptoms that you start to see, and I think I have that over here. Yeah. So it can start with breathing difficulties, mm -hmm. coughing. Diarrhea, weight loss, excessive bleeding. So it can actually affect our yeah. clotting. And even behavior changes. Because you think about well, this yeah. having trouble from the breathe. Yeah, so you can't breathe. And it can be hurts. hard to diagnose. Um, because, like I said, the symptoms can be confused with other things. You could think maybe it's canine flu or, or some stomach virus or something else. So is it like a blood test like we do for heartworm? Or is it x-rays? Or no. do they know? This, it can be a little bit difficult to diagnose. You can sometimes do a special test um, to look for the larva in the stool sample. So we do a flotation that floats the eggs up. You have to do a concentration so test. So it would still pass larva. through the poop. Yes, and because that's they're producing these baby larvae. So you can find those okay. in the stool sample. You can do a lung wash and find the larva in the, the airways. Huh. Um, and those are the, the big ways that you can diagnose it. 
Um, but, you know, trying to keep your dog away from eating snails and slugs would probably be the best way. Just prevent yeah. them from getting it there. And then using the preventative. So if yeah. anyone's listening to us in England and you're not doing your preventative, get on your preventative. Um, and if it ever, you know, I, I've heard of lungworms, and I don't know if we have the same infection in the southern part of the United States here, but it's certainly something that... that could yeah. be spread here pretty easily. Well, this We've is got dogs and foxes, so I don't know if it hits coyotes too, well, maybe? Well, yeah, foxes are, are very common in England, yeah. and they're a big reservoir for infection for, mm-hmm. the, for the dog population. Yeah, so they're just passing it all along. Okay, here's a really cool, a really good story. Um, the last couple months, there's been a Clear the Shelters campaign uh, that's been run, uh, sponsored by a couple of uh, groups. Um, I think um, NBC and Telemundo owned stations were the big sponsors of this. It went from July 27th to August 17th. Over 1,982 shelters participated. And uh, they were they managed to find homes for 135,000 pets in that time. Wow. So they started this in 2015. And just amazing. So they got some of the cats here, or some of the animals that were adopted out there. Snow the cat had been in a shelter for 177 days. Oh, half a year. Six months. Teddy um, the deaf doll. Yes, this is really cool. It's a Catahoula leopard dog mix. And they learned about them on social media. And the really neat thing is they have a daughter who's deaf. So this Aww. is the perfect dog for their family. Aww. Uh, Lamb Daddy. is a five-year-old pity who was living in, in a shelter since Hurricane Harvey. Harvey. Since 2017. Aww. So he found uh, his new home after uh, someone came in and fell in love with him. Yeah. Uh, a couple of uh, older senior cats. Their senior owner had cats. died. They were homeless. They were able to find a home together. And Bob, the four and a half month old white crested black Polish rooster. Polish, that's Polish. Polish. <laughs> but it's a rooster. A so rooster. We're clearing out roosters too. Yes, roosters need homes too. <laughs> so he and he got a great home. He's got seven ladies he's living with in Rhode Island. I want to find that shelter. <laughs> we're going to Rhode Island. I need to get a rooster. Good so they Bob. had a Facebook post, and it was spread around. It reached 19 million users on Facebook throughout the campaign. Wow. And a lot of celebrities and personalities uh, hooked up in it. There was Ellen DeGeneres, um, Lauren Ash of Superstore, William Jackson Parker of The Good Place. I love that show. Aww. That's cool. Angela Kinsey of The Office. Um, Chris Sullivan from This Is Us. Mario Lopez. Mario hey. Lopez. Bob Harper from Biggest Loser. Ooh. He's a big, big uh, animal person. Yeah. So, so be looking for that next year, and uh, we'll certainly once we we're aware of it, we're going to certainly promote that as mm-hmm. well. So, really kind of neat. Moving on, what's next? Um, case of the week. Case of the week. Oh, yes. this is a really nice case. <laughs> This one ended very well for us. Yeah, and, st- and, st- and she's, she's, she's still continuing doing good. treatment, but um, um, Nikki was a uh, Sh- Shetland sheepdog. Shetland sheepdog that came in to me, and she was she had to wear pajamas because her fur and her hair coat was messed up. Yes, she was completely naked. She had like maybe three or four patches of hair. Yes, and like it was her face her paws and then like a few patches on her back bad skin infection Mm -hmm. all over her body licking very itchy Mm -hmm. so we see these dogs a lot not necessarily as bad as nikki but nikki was interesting because there's actually two things going on with nikki and neither of them had been actually properly diagnosed or treated so when she came to me i had just actually been to a meeting where we talked about these types of dogs specifically Mm -hmm. and it's a condition called atopy which is an allergic condition where allergens are absorbed through the skin and cause severe itching secondary skin infections it's results from a defect in their skin itself and in nikki's case we were very suspicious because of all of her hair loss that there might have been something else going on so we tested her thyroid levels because she was also a little round for right. a little Chelsea. <laughs> and her, the thyroid levels didn't even show up on the blood test. No. She wasn't producing any thyroid hormone mm-hmm. at all. So um, we got her started on the thyroid supplement. And then we also treated her um, with an allergy medication. Um, it's called Cytopoint. We're going to yeah. talk about more of that in, the, in another uh, podcast. But it basically, it's a, not a drug. It's an antibody that blocks the molecule that causes the itching. Uh, we for a quick action we put her on a medication called Apoquel. So mm-hmm. Cytopoint takes a few days to kick in. Apoquel starts right away. So we want her to be comfortable right away. Yeah. And then for the skin infection, she could have been on oral antibiotics, but the best antibiotic we have for skin infections is called Convenia. Yeah, it's a long acting injection. It lasts mm-hmm. two weeks. You give them one shot, the blood levels build up within 45 minutes, and it starts them feeling better within yeah. a day. 
So she got that and, uh, and the, uh, the allergy medications. And then when we found out her thyroid results, we had her come in and pick up the thyroid <laughs> yes. pills. So this dog, it looked before like you didn't even know she was a Sheltie. She's show dog quality now. She's beautiful. She's got this long, luxurious fur. She's not oily. Her skin is so pretty and healthy and nice and healthy and pink. She doesn't stink at all. Right. The sad part is she doesn't wear pajamas anymore, but it's still nice to see her. And she just comes in for just to say hello every now and then. And it's nice yeah. to see her and not have to, you know, give her medicated baths or, right. you know, have to wear gloves when we touched her. It's She's just a happy dog now. Right. And all she needs now, is she's going to stay on the thyroid supplement mm-hmm. for life. For and we'll life. monitor her levels, make sure that we're getting the right dose. The side of point, we usually can get the dogs down to every six to eight weeks mm-hmm. for a shot on that. So, I mean, the, the takeaway here is if you have a dog with bad skin, Make sure you're getting the right diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Make sure everything's being checked. And you're getting the best treatment that's available because Mm -hmm. it's amazing how you can turn these dogs around if you get the right diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There are still some dogs that we're stumped on, we're having troubles on. We'll refer people to veterinary dermatologists who see the stinky, smelly dogs all day long, (laughs) um, and they might be able to help. Um, But these new drugs that are coming out, uh, just amazing. And this uh, antibiotic injection, just great for clearing up these infections. Mm-hmm. So just, it's nice to see Nikki when she comes in. Like it you is. said, I don't <laughs> recognize her from the first time I saw her. Mm-hmm. Totally different dog Completely and very different. happy. Yes, she's so happy. She's a different dog now and it's yeah. good. Now, um, we also are going to be doing our tech tips today. Yep. So what do you got for us for tech tips? This um, so tech tips this week is um, no trims for pets. Okay. Um, so when you get a pet, most owners don't think, you know, to work on the paws or get the pet, especially puppies, get them used to touching their nails. Right. Um, so when they bring us to bring them to us, you know, we have puppies or, you know, one year old dog never had their paws touched or anything, or you grab the paws and you play with them. And so now they think, and we're doing it. It right. makes it much more difficult for us. Um, yeah, when, when they don't want you to touch their feet, no, it's really hard to work with them. Especially when people get big dogs. Um, or, you know, when people try to do nail trims at home, that's one big thing that I always try to stress. If you don't know what you're doing at home, please do not try to cut nails because if you hit something called the quick, that is the nerve that's in the nail and that's where that blood is at. Right. Sometimes that just turns off a six month old puppy for life. And then we have to see them for nail trims or things like that. And we have to sedate them or sometimes we even have to do the little party hat, which isn't fun, but Cutting nails, we recommend doing it, you know, about, you know, every six to eight weeks. Right. We have some owners that we see once a year and they get upset because we can't cut the nails back as much as they want us to do. But they don't realize, unlike our nails, their nerve in it that quick grows with the nails. So we can't just cut away and keep cutting to the length that you want. Right. We can only cut back as far as we can without hurting the pet. And we know we're, we don't want to do something called show cuts where you literally have to cut the quicks on those. purpose. Yeah. They're not fun. The dog has to get their paws numb. It's pretty much you're like declawing your dog at that point. It's not fun. Um, so coming in regularly for nail trims, not trying it at home if you don't know what right. you're doing. We had one owner try that. She quick the dog. It's a six-month-old puppy. He comes in on sedatives now because we can't even touch his paws. We have to. Mom right. brings him in muzzled. And, and for cats, too. I mm-hmm. mean, there are a lot of cats that don't like their claws oh, touched yeah. and don't like them having clipped. Mm-hmm. If we can get in there and do that... Um, it's, it's, it's easier to clip cat's claws, I think, than dog's claws if they'll let yeah. you. Well, and then usually cat claws, you can see it because most cats right. have, they're like, white, white nails. nails, and yeah. you can see the pink quick. Every now and then you have, like, a black too. one, yeah. but dog ones are always harder. Yeah. Um, but cats, usually cats aren't that bad <laughs> for nail trims. Cats, that's what I'll give them. Usually if you can get a hold of the cat, yeah. you can do a nail trim. And, and one on thing them. I, I just want to add with um, people who are thinking about getting their cats declawed, Try trimming your nails first. Mm-hmm. It makes a huge difference. Huge difference. If you're trimming your nails every month and keeping them short, they're not going to be doing any damage to mm-hmm. your furniture or to you. Now, there are some cats that it is a problem. Yeah. We mm-hmm. reluctantly will do that. Mm-hmm. We don't like to do it. But if it means doing declining a cat and putting him to sleep, 
We're gonna or try losing and, a home. Yeah, losing a home, but we're going to go for that. But We do have some owners that tried Petty Paws. Petty Paws um, are Those neat. are the fake nails that you put, you, bring, mm -hmm, you yeah. bring them to us. I we see. cut the nails nice and short. We glue on the nails. They are fun colors. I will say I did it for my own cat. Um, he had pink and red for Valentine's Day, and he was fabulous. And the fun thing is, though, with Petty Paws, they learn to stop being dependent on those nails. So we have one uh -huh. owner that came in once a month every year i mean for a year right with their cat they don't need to do it anymore and the cat still has his her claws she just stopped depending on her nails now now we only see her for nail trims because after she used the petty paws she can't she doesn't scratch anymore she doesn't you know every now and then she'll get hooked on a rug or something but the owners are like she's a completely different cat now she doesn't scratch the furniture or anything anymore just mm -hmm. because she got used to those petty paws being right. there and, and they are so cool looking. They are so fun. You can get glitter, a rainbow. You can get any wow, color. Wow. Yeah, they're glitter. That's that's fancy. <laughs> Don't catch me doing that. <laughs> we'll get some on Hedwig <laughs> next time you bring them in. And so, and then the, the other thing, when the nails get long, one of the big things we see at least once a week is a dog tearing your nail on something. Mm -hmm. And so that's that very nails. painful for them. It can bleed. It can get infected. It's mm -hmm. very sore and painful. And then if the nail comes completely off, it can take months for that nail to grow back if ever. Mm -hmm. And then um, the fluffy dogs. You know, a lot of times owners don't notice. We, and unfortunately, we saw this a few times this week already. These really fluffy dogs, the nails start to curl over. Yeah. And make it hard for the dog to walk. So we'll see a dog in for limping, and all we do is part the fur, and we just say, oh, their nails are crossed over. You know, you just yeah. cut those nails and fix the paws again. Or they curl around right into the pad. Right into the pad, yeah. We see that happen a lot of times with mostly cats, I see that. I've seen um, it in dogs, too, where they've, they've grown all the way Yeah, through. they grow around. It's like uh, you get like three or 270 degrees of the nail. Like this just like three mm -hmm. quarters of a circle. Just goes right into the up. pad, and that's... It just gets swollen. Yeah. There's a lot of pus in there. It's But yeah, if painful. you can't see the feet, you're, you may not notice that. And mm -hmm. then they, they're limping. All right. That's great. That yep. sounds very useful. Make sure you're getting your pet used to having their pets, their, their feet handled from when they're very young. Mm -hmm. And getting those nails trimmed regularly so that they don't get to the point where they can get a broken nail. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's all we have for today. Yep. Next week, um, we haven't forgotten cat owners. We're going to talk about the cat vaccines next week. Uh, and we're going to talk about them all in one bunch because there's not very many cat vaccines to go over. But uh, we'll do the cat core and non-core vaccines Still next week. Still is important. Yeah. Because um, a lot of people who have dogs have cats. Yep. So it's important that they do it. And a lot of people who have cats don't bring their cats in for vaccines. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about why it's essential that you do yeah. that. So that's all for this week. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany again. Thanks for listening to Pet Factor. Bye.